Welcome back, geologists, for the second half of Devonian. This is the really exciting side of the Devonian process because we're going to learn about the life forms. So we're going to start with what was happening with the age of the fishes, go through the marine life, the fish life, then transition from water to land. Let's start with a common type of brachiopod called a spearifer, which is this guy right here. Notice he kind of looks like he has wings. It was named after somebody in the Orient, actually, who thought that they look like a specific type of insect and uh, just by their shape and morphology. But nevertheless, um, this guy is important. Spirifers are very unique articulated brachiopods, and they would reach their maximum diversity during the Devonian and they would exist until the end of the Permian where unfortunately for most brachiopods they didn't do so hot at the end. We also know that there's an interesting fact to talk about trilobites. The world's largest trilobites, meaning in length, existed during the Devonian for whatever reason. The Kaskaskia Sea was a good real estate time to be a trilobite. Some of these trilobites got up to two and a half feet long. There were mega species. Of course, they're all different sizes, but understand that this was a unique time for big ones to exist, and then they shrink back up until they go extinct at the end of the Permian period. A big announcement to make in the marine department. One of my personal favorite fossils of all time is the ammonite. While we had cephalopods up until this point, we did not have ammonoids. This is a giant ammonite that I saw while I was in Australia at a place that they were uh, selling something very important and dear to my heart, which are opals. A whole other story on how opals are formed because they're actually fossiliferous mineral deposits. This was uh, hanging in their window and you know, I was like, I wanna buy it and take it home. And like, no way. So this one was huge and ammonites would reach their peak in the Cretaceous, but they made their debut entrance to the fossil record during the Devonian. So let's, uh, Hang on to that thought about ammonites and we'll have a much more lengthy discussion as they become prominent in the Mesozoic. You can't talk about the Devonians without talking about all types of fishes. Acanthododians were mentioned during the Silurian as they made their debut then and they're going to radiate throughout the Devonian period but they'll start to diminish until they go extinct at the end of the Permian. These guys, along with the bony fish, and of course, which you'll see with some of the other fish that we'll learn about, kind of outdid the poor ostracoderms from the late Cambrian. Such a shame. Those guys will go belly up pretty much by the end of this period. Cartilaginous fish made their debut during the early Devonian. Now, these are marked by fossils of teeth that we find for primitive sharks. Sharks will radiate throughout geologic time and especially become prevalent during uh, the Mesozoic and certainly after the marine species of reptiles that were in the oceans went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, they would radiate more in the Cenozoic. But nevertheless, the first primitive shark appears in the early Devonian and is marked by fossil teeth. The first bony fish evolved during the Devonian, and that's important because bony fish represent a large change in the fish population. So basically that means we're going to have all types of fish. We'll be getting into how they're subdivided shortly, but I want to feature one that's kind of an important dude in just a second. I should point out that bony fish are thought to be uh, the ancestors to amphibians, and we'll look at a specific group of them in just a minute. Along those lines, placoderm is one of those really important fish to talk about. Dunkyostelis is a famous version of a placoderm, which is who you're seeing right here. Placoderms came in a variety of sizes and shapes, but they're notorious for breaching their 
maximum diversity during the Devonian until they slowly decline until they reach the Permian where they go fully extinct. So we can actually list them as an index fossil for the Devonian simply because there were so many different kinds and certain species that lived during this time. The largest species, as I just mentioned, they got up to 36 feet long with these razor sharp jaws. Imagine coming in contact with one of them. I've been to natural history museums all over the world now and placoderms pretty much appear in most of them because they're really cool. But the average person looks at them and thinks they're some kind of weird shark. They are not. They are actually a fish and they represent a specific type of bony fish and in this case there are very armored uh, bodies, their faces are at least. And remember that they occupied a number of different niches, not just top of the food chain but all the way down to scavengers. When we look at the fish in more detail, we need to look at a couple of fish in particular, the ray fin fish and the lobe fin fish. Ray fin fish are what you would be most associated with and have your most familiarity with. So you go to a seafood restaurant and you order sea bass or you order trout or you order tuna. These would all be examples of some type of a ray fin fish. What separates them from lobe fin fish? These animals have their fins supported by thin bones. These thin bones spread away from the body and that allows them to propel themselves where they have a difference in structure from lobe fin fish. For example, this is a lobe fin fish right here and this is a ray fin fish. So let's talk about the significance of lobe fin, L-O-B-E. Lobe fin fish have articulated bones and these bones in their hands or their wrist in the fin are attached to the body. See how they actually make a wrist type structure right here? The importance of coelacanths are this. They are the marine lobe fish that evolved during the Middle Devonian and they were thought to have gone extinct in the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period. As you can see right here, here's a living species of them. It's totally not the case. In 1938, a gentleman uh, was fishing in deep water off the coast of Madagascar and caught one. And since then, there have been over 24 more caught and many scientific studies done where divers have actually discovered and seen these things in person. This particular picture is an example of that. So, Coelacanths are very important because they kind of represent a Lazarus taxa, one that we thought was dead and extinct and has been around this entire time unless it just re-evolved all of a sudden. Likely they just haven't been seen and we don't have a fossil record of them that we have found thus far that links them from any time past the Cretaceous period. Longfish are an important discussion to have in the Devonian period. They became abundant during the Devonian and today we still have three freshwater genera that exist. What makes these guys so special is the swim bladder that they have. All fish really have swim bladders. Most use it for buoyancy control while they're swimming. But what the lungfish uses it for is a different purpose for survival in stagnated river and lake bottoms. What they do is they burrow into the sediment and they use the oxygen that they've been absorbing in the swim bladder and they wait until the stream refloods to surface back into that water body. It's kind of an ingenious way of living to survive a, a time when streams or lakes dry out. So uh, lungfish are thought to be the link to amphibians and let's look a little bit further. Crossoptera geans are an important lobe fin fish because we think that amphibians 
likely evolved from them. There's an ancestral group of Ripodistians that are used as a classic example of the transitional form between the bony fish and amphibians. Uh, specifically of the bony fish, remember we're talking lobe fin fish here. These guys had an elongated body that would have been useful for moving around on land and for moving fast in water. And they had muscular fins that were probably used for moving on land. So if this is the case, if they are really related, is there more to the story? Let's find out. The transition into an amphibian would not be a simple task. This is a classic example of what organisms that move to land would have to face. We've already talked about that with the insects that have to move on land. And then, of course, what plants will have to overcome and their major challenges to survive on land. Discoveries of older lobe fin fish, tetrapod footprints, and tetrapod-like fish are helping geologists and paleontologists to redefine the gaps in the evolution of fish into tetrapods. If you don't know what a tetrapod is, those are animals with four legs. The evolution of amphibians presented the same challenges that we have investigated for insects moving onto land and that we've talked about with plants moving onto land. The first is drying out, which is desiccation. Number two is how do you reproduce outside of the water? Number three, what does the gravity impacts do for how your body build and your anatomy needs to be uh, made up of in terms of bone structure? And then the most important probably is how do you extract oxygen by your lungs rather than your gills? These are all the challenges of evolution that amphibians will have to overcome in order to figure out how to move from water onto land and share both environments as their habitat. The current hypothesis about why limbs evolved has actually been challenged recently, but let's talk about the original hypothesis that still seems to have the dominant consensus among scientists. Animals evolved the need for aquatic limbs to move around in streams and lakes and swamps that are full of wetland types of plants. I still don't think that that's off the mark. However, fossils that have been found in coral reef lagoon regions with those types of fossils in place have kind of given us a different direction to look into. It's challenging the initial hypothesis of what we think those limbs were for. Instead, those limbs might have been used to move through seagrasses, things of that nature. So the discovery of these tetrapod uh, tetrapod footprints and coral reef lagoons has really put a question mark as to which habitat was the need for these limbs initially developed. Acanthostega is a famous first tetrapod in the Devonian aged rocks of the old red sandstone found from Greenland. These fossils are special for a couple of reasons because they show that the limbs and the body plan of this animal we're just not yet ready for fully making it on land. What it shows is that their limbs were just not uh, big enough to withstand the gravity, the weight, and the necessary changes that happen when an animal needs to be in and walking around the ground as opposed to water. Even their rib cage was too small for the necessary muscle attachments in order to have the right strength to move around on land and hold itself up as it walked. It had gills and lung, making it very suitable for spending most of its life in the water with an occasional visit to land. Uh, you could call it its regular, let's go see what's going on out there, but I prefer to live in the water type of animal. A late Devonian fishapod has been discovered in Canada in 2006, and it's considered the intermediate form between the earliest tetrapod and fish. So a brand new discovery has been made that will help link the two together. Here's what it has that our first earliest tetrapod did not. Yes, it has gills. Yes, it has fish scales. Its eyes are on the top of its head, which is a little bit very in tune with amphibians. 
A functional wrist bone with five digits, that's sounding more like an amphibian, has a large rib cage necessary to support its body on land or in shallow water, so it had adequate muscle attachments and places for muscles to exist for it to carry its weight. Had a broad skull, which is indicative of living on land. It had a flexible neck, which indicates that uh, another land characteristic had lungs and a modified ear region, which would have been necessary for balance on land. So this appearance of the fishopod kind of gives us a linkage between our bony fish and our first tetrapod. The first amphibian is referred to as ichthyostega, and ichthyostega is a late Devonian appearance that has characteristics that gave them clear adaptions for walking on land. They had streamlined bodies with long tails, indicative of something that will evolve into a reptilian characteristic. Most of them had fins on their backs. They had four legs, a strong backbone, and this thing right here is a good indication of that. When you see these types of bones, they're not necessarily for fat tissue, they're for attachments of muscles. They had a broad rib cage and pelvic and pectoral girdles, which would have held the muscles necessary to be moving on land. So an important discovery and an important evolution to see our first real amphibian in the rock record. Another Devonian development on land was the first wingless insects and spiders. Remember that we had millipedes move on land. Well, we know that we probably also had uh, scorpions that existed back in the Silurian, but now we're going to have things that look more like this. So you're going to start to develop distinctive arthropods that will exist on land that still haven't learned how to fly yet. The miracle about insects is that they kind of learn to live in all environments. And so we start seeing wingless insects and spiders at the beginning of the Devonian period. I think this is such a noteworthy thing to discuss about the Devonian is the first noticeable soils. Need to think about this for a minute, the significance. I know I mentioned it at the beginning of the lecture on Devonian, but this is such an important development. So our first plants really start to move on to land. They're very primitive in the Silurian, by the late Silurian for sure. Early Devonian, we're starting to get some diversity. So plants biodegrade and the bacteria that makes up the organic material of the soil is important. And that soil is going to allow for root systems to develop. So if we have well-developed soils, it would naturally seem the next step in plant evolution would, to have, would be to have a chance for rooting systems like bigger, taller plants and even trees start to make their appearance. If you've got a nice soil foundation, even forests can start to grow. That is certainly the case for the Devonian and all of the things I just listed about trees and forest. So let's look a little bit further at that. We would see a change in plant population during the Devonian, not necessarily in the number of genera that were there, but the composition of the flora, meaning plants, would change throughout the period. Early Devonian plants were dominated by small, low-growing, bog-dwelling, again, marsh-related wetlands types of plants. But we would see a shift to that by the late Devonian, where we contained forest with large tree-sized plants that were up to 30 feet tall. So something must have happened during the Devonian that empowered plants to radiate in a different manner. So what was the transition for making this happen? The development of heterospory is a very big deal for plants. This is important because before seed plants could ever evolve, an intermediate evolutionary step occurred because plants could develop two types of spores at the same time. The spores would look like this. There would be one megaspore, which would be like these guys right here, and they're actually gals, to be honest. These were the female plants that would provide the necessary spores for germination and provided the eggs. Where the second is the smaller types of spores and you're looking at the female and the male there. And these would produce the male or the sperm that would uh, complete the cycle. So this was a big step. It's transition step number one. 
The second transition step for plants was the development of progymnosperms. This emerged in the middle to late Devonian, and gymnosperms is a big deal. So what happens is these plants are going to be able to produce a seed. So these plants had fern-like productive habits, but they had gymnosperm anatomy. So we're almost to the point where they could make the full gymnosperm seed, just not quite there yet. So several transitions, steps one and two, to get to the real meal deal of gymnosperms. So obviously in the Devonian, if we were able to have forest, we had to have a gymnosperm. The evolution of the seed gave plants a chance to free themselves, if a better word is even to liberate themselves from their dependence on water. So that allowed them to germinate and populate areas that did not contain water bodies. This is a big deal. That means that they can move into drier land. They can start to populate unplant colonized areas. That means free real estate for plants. In the seed method of reproduction, here's what happens. The spores are not released to the environment like you would see in a, in a non-gymnosperm type situation. They are retained on the spore-bearing plant where they grow into a male and female form in order to germinate. So that's a real advanced way to deal with the water requirement for these vascular plants and non-vascular plants. So gymnosperms now have a seed and the seed does the job for reproduction. We can't finish the Devonian without having a little gloom and doom. This is the second of the five Hall of Fame mass extinction events. The first one was in the Ordovician and concluded that geologic period. Well, the Devonian will be no exception. We have a glaciation event that occurred in Gondwana land on the continents of Africa and South America and even in eastern North America where we would see alpine glaciers begin to form in the recent uplifted Acadia uh, highlands. Nevertheless, this climatic shift because a glaciation would cause regressions in sea level to drop. What was the end result? A sea level drop, marine life is going to respond immediately. So about 19% of all invertebrate genera went extinct. 50% of all genera on land went extinct. 70% of all species, period, went extinct. So this was a pretty big deal. It was a very important mass extinction event, and we know that it kind of wiped out a couple of populations of the, for example, ostracoderms went extinct at this time. Our poor trilobites had another wipeout. They lost about another 50% of what was left of them. So this was a time of loss, especially in the marine department, but the land got hit too. Plants got hit if all genera went extinct, 50% of them. We're going to have a time of rediversification in the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian, and we'll see you back for the next lecture series over the Mississippian period. Bye.
every museum that has a chronology, a geologic time, likely will have a placoderm model or fossil or replica available for you to go see. At first glance, people tend to think it's a primitive fish, but meaning like a shark. But no, it was not made of cartilage like we see our uh, sharks today.